evening, everybody. Um, so I don't have a microphone. Um, is everybody hearing me okay if I speak at this volume? Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about drug-induced nutrient depletion. And this is a topic that is important for us in the pharmacy. Um, we want people to use their medications safely and also know how their medications affect other things in their life, including nutrition. So that's what this presentation is about. So um, the things I basically want you to be able to take away from this talk, um, I'd like you to know, um, be able to list several important nutrients that can be affected by medications that we take. And this includes both prescription medicines and over-the-counter medicines. Um, I'd like you to know a couple of ways that drugs can cause nutrient depletion. Um, and I'd like you to know who might be at risk for having issues related to this and when it's important to ask a doctor or pharmacist. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so these are a few ways that medications can impact our nutritional status. Um, the beginning is always absorption, um, getting the nutrients we need into our bodies. Um, and drugs that interfere with stomach acid can often cause problems because many nutrients need the acid to be broken down and then absorbed. Um, so antacids are an example. Many people will take proton pump inhibitors, especially which are now available over the counter. An example would be um, Prevacid or Prilosec. Um, there's also many medications that can cause nausea as a side effect or even just decreased appetite as a side effect, and that can limit our food intake and subsequently also limit the amount of nutrition that we get out of foods. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, certain medications increase the amount of medication that, of um, nutrients that leave our body. Um, sometimes that's actually the intended effect of the drug. Um, a diuretic decreases blood pressure by increasing output of fluids, um, and with that goes a lot of things that are dissolved in water, minerals, vitamins, um, laxatives, same idea. Um, you lose more material, including some that could be beneficial. Um, another mechanism is medications that interfere with good bacteria in our bodies. A lot of vitamins are actually produced by bacteria, not just from foods that we eat or from our own bodies. Um, one kind of well-known example of this would be vitamin K. A lot of that is produced by our own good bacteria. And when we take antibiotics, sometimes that'll destroy some of the good bacteria and potentially lead to an issue. Um, another kind of broad category would be changing the way that the body uses nutrients that it gets. Um, so anything that affects hormones, hormones are chemical messengers and they definitely change how our body decides to do things. Um, another, then the final thing would be metabolism, which is a really general term, but it can mean how fast um, vitamins and minerals and whatever we ingest um, is going to be processed and how fast it might leave the body. Okay, so as far as who might be at risk, um, the kind of the, the biggest thing to look out for is people taking certain types of medications and kind of the ones that I already mentioned are the big ones. Um, anything that affects stomach acid such as heartburn medications, um, there's a good chance that there are going to be some nutrients, some vitamins and minerals that you don't absorb as much of as you would have. Um, antibiotics are a big one because of destroying the good bacteria, although they also have other mechanisms of interfering with nutrition. Uh, steroids are a big one because they affect hormones. And any time that somebody is taking a really large number of medications, the more medications you're on, the more likely there's going to be one that's somewhere on this list. Um, Any time that somebody has poor health status to begin with, that can make you vulnerable to the effects of losing vitamins or not getting as much compared to somebody who's generally healthy. 
Anytime that someone already doesn't absorb things well, such as people who have low stomach acid to begin with, as happens in various medical conditions and even just as we get older, they have to be even more careful about these types of issues. And the, um, the biggest thing is sometimes people don't get an adequate diet or don't get enough variety in their diet. And that makes it more likely that you're already not getting as many vitamins and minerals as you need. And that makes it more likely that medications can cause more of an issue by limiting nutritional status. Um, children and pregnant women and elderly adults are particularly vulnerable because of their needs and also sometimes because they may have a more difficult time consuming the right nutritious foods. Okay. So when to ask questions, starting a new medication, starting an antibiotic, making a major dietary change such as going on an elimination diet, um, anytime that you have unexplained symptoms, um, sometimes people may you know, have kind of a nagging symptom and there's no other, there's no um, identifiable cause. Sometimes it's good to look at a root cause. Maybe there's a problem with diet and maybe it can even be something that's caused by medications. And um, the question at the bottom, do you guys think that dietary supplements might also sometimes cause depletion of nutrients? Like an herbal medicine, do you think any of those might limit absorption of nutrients? Yeah, absolutely. So that's also a thing to keep in mind. Um, though the focus of tonight is about medication specifically. Okay, so now I'm going to go over some of the vitamins and minerals that are important and that can be affected by these issues. So kind of the big five minerals that we might worry about would be calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, and potassium. You know, calcium obviously is important for bone health, and this is way too small, I apologize for this, but you can see it's a really long list of medications then that can affect absorption of calcium. So you have your medicines that affect um, stomach acid. You have, um, believe it or not, actually medicines that are for osteoporosis because they change the way your body uses calcium. If you don't also supplement with calcium, you can end up with a deficiency. Um, estrogens and steroids and even thyroid hormones, they might increase the processing of bone, basically the turnover of bone, because it's not just a static thing. Um, and anything that affects your metabolism can affect the rate of bone turnover, and then you might need more calcium. Um, some seizure medications actually can interfere with calcium absorption. Magnesium is another one that's also important for bone health, also for muscle and nerve health. And some of the same things can affect that, um, acid blocking medications, some antibiotics, um, some steroids, and even some heart medicines. Um, another one is iron. Um, you do need some acid in your stomach to absorb iron. Um, but a lot of people wouldn't think about some of the pain medicines that can affect iron absorption. Um, so if, even if you take over-the-counter Motrin or Advil, um, drugs in that class, they can actually limit absorption of iron if you take large enough amounts of them. Zinc um, can be depleted by some very popular blood pressure medications, um, ACE inhibitors. So that'd be like lisinopril or... Um, Ramapril, there's a, a long list of them. Perindopril is a newer one, but a lot of people take those medications um, and probably don't know that zinc levels can be affected. Um, also the acid blockers, diuretics, and um, some hormones. And then potassium um, can be, there's a lot of diuretics that cause potassium loss, but there are a few that actually serve to preserve potassium. So that's an important distinction. Vitamin C, you can actually lose that from taking certain types of diuretics. Um, and you can also lose it from certain types of um, pain medicines and steroids from inflammation. 
And the interesting part is that goes along with iron because vitamin C helps with iron absorption. So it might actually make sense for some people who are on pain medicine to supplement with a vitamin C and iron combination. Let's see, vitamin D, um, we all know about this one. It's important for bone health and some of the same medications that interfere with calcium and magnesium can also cause depletion of vitamin D. So that might be particularly important um, for women, um, for people who are older, or um, anyone who's concerned about their bone health. Um, so one of the recommendations I have seen from um, some integrative practitioners is that people who are taking some of these medications, um, especially the antacids, estrogen therapy, corticosteroids, or um, histamine 2 receptor blockers um, that they supplement with 2,000 units of vitamin D. B vitamins are a big category. Um, the two that seem to be most affected or listed most often are vitamin B12 and folic acid. And those two are both important for synthesis of new red blood cells. And having depletion of them can lead to anemia. Um, so there are some medicines that can interfere with those. One is metformin, which is a really common medication for type 2 diabetes. Um, there are also some seizure medications, um, antibiotics. There are some medicines that specifically actually target folic acid um, that are used for rheumatic diseases. Um, and a lot of the time, people who are on those medications may be prescribed folic acid in addition. Other B vitamins. Um, can be depleted by a range of different medications as well, including some diuretics, some hormones, and antibiotics. And then uh, this last one, coenzyme Q10, is something that some people know a lot about and other people have no idea what it is because it's, it's not actually a vitamin. It's a vitamin-like substance. Um, it's also called ubiquinol, and this is because it's ubiquitous in the body tissues. It's everywhere. Um, and it's needed for electron transport, which produces our energy in the form of ATP. M normally, people don't need to supplement with this, um, but people who take statin drugs for lowering cholesterol can sometimes have um, muscle weakness, muscle pain, and that can actually be related to not the body no longer being able to produce enough coenzyme Q10. So those are the people for whom we sometimes will recommend this supplement. These are just some of my references. And since we had a little bit of a late start, I want to make sure that um, we have plenty of time for our main speaker. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Alex Bingham. He's going to talk to us about a holistic approach to allergies and asthma. Thank you. Set? Can people hear me? OK, great. Um, well, I just want to welcome everyone and uh, say that I'm very pleased to be here. I was honored to be asked to speak by uh, Hopkinton Drug. And they approached me last summer and asked me to, to speak and asked me what I'd like to talk about. And I thought that maybe I would talk about something that I'm passionate about. And uh, I was thinking about allergies and asthma and allergic disease. And so I thought. Maybe what I could talk about is some of the stuff that I do around this and how a, a holistic approach to allergic disease can offer a, uh, the best way or a very good way of approaching this illness uh, and illnesses. Um, okay, let me get all this stuff ready. There we go. So just in terms of a little personal bio, I work at the Rothfeld Center in Waltham, Massachusetts. I direct the allergy program. i um, been a family doc for 27 years. And uh, <clears throat> recently, last year, there was a new board certification of, called Integrative Physician, and I was grandfathered in. Um, uh, 
let me just say a little bit about integrative physician. The word integrated medicine right now means that you're kind of like uh, using many different modalities and or you're referring to people so that you can use things like acupuncture and chiropractic and nutrition to help people get better. Now, it doesn't mean that the person who is an integrative physician can do all those things, but they practice within that kind of model. Um, and so I became board certified, and I've been practicing holistic, functional, integrative medicine for about 18 years. And um, uh, for what I do largely is called functional medicine. And what functional medicine is, is a uh, using our knowledge of genetics and in the environment, um, physiology, biochemistry, to try to figure out what the causes of people's symptoms and problems are so that we can move toward rebalancing the body and restoring health, okay? It's not just about removing illness, but it's about trying to restore health. Um, I've trained with the American Academy of Otolaryngic Allergy, which are the Ear, Nose, and Throat Allergy Academy, the Environmental Medicine Group. Well, that's a nice typo. Um, and I've done a lot of functional medicine training with the Institute of Functional Medicine, the Academy of Integrative and Health and Medicine, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, and so on. Um, so, oh, okay, I gotta look at it. So why, why are we concerned with allergies? And what are we, why does this matter, okay? So I thought I would start with some statistics. And uh, the CDC doesn't have statistics more recent than 2012, but basically, if you just look at allergies, hay fever, 17.6 million adults just diagnosed in the past 12 months, 7.8 .8 million kids. Food allergies, 4.1 million. I think in talking, we'll, f we'll find out why this is really a way too low a number. Um, skin allergies like eczema and things like that, 8.8 .8 million. And the total number of visits to physician offices where the primary diagnosis is like hay fever is 11, over 11 million per year. Now, if we look at how they graph something like this, this is just kids 0 to 18 years old. But you can see that the respiratory allergies like hay fever is about level. But look at the eczema and stuff. It's increasing. And so are the food allergies. Now, this is a percentage. And because the population is always growing, that means that there are more and more people all the time. As far as asthma is concerned, 18.7 million adults, 6.8 million kids. 1.8 million visits to the emergency room for asthma and 3,600 deaths per year. Again, if you look at this, there's a slow increase in the percentage. So these, these illnesses are getting worse. I thought it'd be interesting to talk about why that might be the case, but that's, I think, a discussion for another day. So in defining what is an allergy, it's an abnormal reaction by the immune system to what would normally be a harmless substance. Now, if the immune system attacks something that's coming from outside the body, pollen, pets, food, chemicals, it's called an allergy. If it's attacking something that's inside the body, that's called an autoimmune disorder. So it's attacking the own body tissues, thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. This is the immune system working against itself, but these are harmless substances that the body is targeted to fight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about allergy. Now, one of the things that, that I think is the most important thing is, why is it important to take a holistic approach as opposed to the conventional approach? Well, if we look at the conventional approach, we'll divide people into different systems. You got the nose, you got the sinuses, you got the ears, the skin, the lungs, the digestive tract, and you're going to go to a different specialist for each one of those things. So it's dividing people up. You're going to get treatments from everyone. You can get side effects to that. Sometimes they interact within one another. And one of the things that I think is a real problem is it creates dependence on the medical system. So basically, you're looking to the medical system to make you feel better. It also doesn't address the underlying cause. Now, if you look at a holistic approach, this is going to integrate the various symptoms and complaints into a comprehensive picture of the whole person. It's going to connect the dots. It looks for the underlying causes and how the physiology, the biochemistry, is uh, 
uh, causing your symptoms. Treatment attempts to restore health, not just remove illness. It encourages independence and self-management by teaching people and giving people a toolkit. This is what I do for this. This is what I do for that. This is why this works or this doesn't. We got a mic? Okay. I don't need this. So. Does that help at all? Yeah? Better? I mean, you can even wear that. If okay. You, if you wanted to. For just, that's just for the room. Is that working a bit any better? Yeah. Okay. So, um, at one point, uh, I, I had some questions asked about how effective some of the stuff was that we do, and people that where I was working were very curious, and I was too. So we took a group of people when they came in with allergy-type symptoms, and we asked them to list their symptoms and a severity, one to ten, runny nose, fatigue, asthma, coughing, wheezing, whatever they wanted to choose. And of those 50 people, 43 showed improvement of every single marker. And so I took the seven, and I looked at the seven that didn't. And two of those had gotten worse after they had gotten better. And we discovered that they were now in their fall allergy season. And when we treated those holistically, those two got better as well. So for me, it, it, it really helped to prove that, that, that this approach is really effective. Now, in thinking about allergies, I think it's really important here tonight to think about what happens during an allergic reaction. What's actually going on in the body? And I'm going to ask for some patience with this because it's a little detailed. And um, so let's just step, go through this a little bit. Now, there's a classification system that's generally agreed upon to explain different types of reactions in the immune system. And tonight, we're going to talk about type 1 and type 3 because that seems to be the most pertinent for allergies, okay? Type 1 hypersensitivity. This is what most people think about when they think about allergies, okay? Something where you get exposed to something, you have an immediate reaction. Well, this is immediate hypersensitivity. And it has to be developed over time. So what starts is allergens, this could be, let's say it's a person who's allergic to cats. So these cat allergens get introduced to the immune system. And the immune system sensitizes and starts making tons of antibodies against cat. And these antibodies get lined up around these cells called mast cells. Now these are deposited all along our, what we call our mucosal surfaces. That's that pink, shiny, wet material in your nose, your sinuses, your mouth, throat, lungs, your digestive tract. And they're full of histamine. So you've got all these little molecules of, of, of uh, antibody. Each molecule can re re react to only one substance, but you could have tens of thousands on one cell. So theoretically, you could re react to almost anything. Now later, when you get exposed to your allergens and these things come in and they get attached to the uh, antibodies, the cell blows apart and all the histamine is released. Well, that's why you take antihistamines. So that's, you're going to be itchy, congested. You might have wheezing if it's in your lungs. You could have nausea and vomiting, diarrhea if it's in your gut, uh, eczema or hives, things like that. So that's what a type 1 hypersensitivity is, looks like, and it's, it's quick. The thing that I think really differentiates a holistic approach to allergy from a lot of other things is a type 3 reaction. And this one's a little more difficult. Now, these little Y-shaped things are antibodies that are in the blood now. These aren't on the surface of the body. And they're called IgG, whereas the other ones were called IgE. And these little egg-shaped things are allergens. So we're talking about food at this point, because you're not going to have pollen and cats and stuff floating around the blood. But when you have these little food particles, they can kind of create this kind of uh, a grouping, which is like a clump. Okay, It's called an immune complex. So there's antibodies, and there's antigens, the allergens. And these are going to float around through the bloodstream, and they're going to get deposited somewhere in the tissue of the body. Now, once they start building up there, it starts attracting and causing inflammation. So if this is in the nose, you might have congestion or runny nose. If this is in your joints, you might have arthritis. If it's in your stomach and digestive tract, you could have irritable bowel syndrome, pain, diarrhea, cramping, gas, bloating. Uh, you could have eczema in the skin. If it's in the brain, you might have migraine headaches or ADHD. This is a delayed reaction. It takes a couple days for one exposure for these to be deposited. 
and you have to do it over and over and over again before you start building up symptoms. And this is what really differentiates, I think, uh, a, a holistic approach from other approaches. And I want to go into this a little bit because I think that food allergies is something that is horribly misunderstood. When most people think of food allergies, you think of eating something and all of a sudden you break out in hives and you can't breathe and you're itching and swelling and all this kind of stuff. That's a type 1 reaction. But if you have a delayed reaction, this type 3, it's going to be a very different picture. People read this? I don't know. It's... No. Well, then we'll go on. Um, in terms of uh, food allergies, we talked a little bit about the type 1. So that's about 10 to 15 percent of food reactions. Type 3, 85 to 90 percent. But much more important. This was within minutes to a few hours. This is within hours to days. This is genetically determined. This is generally acquired from repeated exposures. So we've already talked about how these immediate type symptoms can happen. But you can have reactions almost anywhere with these delayed reactions. And that makes it very difficult to figure out what's causing it. So today's Thursday. You'd be reacting to things you'd eat on Tuesday and Monday. And it depends on how much and how frequently. So let's just say you're allergic to gluten, wheat, dairy, tomatoes, yeast. And you've got, you're eating those things commonly, and you've got some symptoms, and you have pizza three days in a row. And the next two weeks, you're miserable. And you're saying, well, I didn't eat anything different. But you did, because you made a lot more immune complexes that deposited in your tissues and caused more inflammation. Everyone is going to deposit in their own pattern. So we call that the target organ. So if my target organ is my brain and I'm having headaches and I eat those foods, I'm going to have more headaches. Another person might have joint pain. This just uh, talks a little bit about, more about the same thing. The, the point here is that there's a delayed onset and there's a variable presentation. It makes it very difficult to diagnose with, by taking a food diary or something like that. Now, I'd like to talk about the different kinds of medical conditions that you can see with allergic disease. And this is interesting as well, OK? On the left side, I think everyone would agree that hay fever and asthma and eczema hives, angioedema, which is kind of the swelling of your lips or eyes, uh, think Jennifer Lopez in Monster in Law. That's angioedema, okay? Anaphylaxis. But this is less commonly associated with allergies. Frequent respiratory infections. How many kids just sick all the time? Or people, you get a cold, you get better, you get another cold. You get a sinus infection, you can't get better, you get another sinus infection. Rosacea, that red rash in the face, sometimes with pimples and things like that. Irritable bowel syndrome, headache syndromes, reflux disease, heartburn, arthritis, vertigo, very commonly caused by allergies. And then autoimmune disease. These are just inward uh, uh, activation of the immune system. How would you know if you might have an allergy? Boy, what happened to that slide? Oh, look at that. OK, so let's get them all out there. I didn't even know I did that. Um, so in terms of the eyes, itching, burning, you might have a tearing, discharge. For the ear, chronic ear infections. Eustachian tube dysfunction, the, the popping or blocking of the ears, like when you come off an airplane. People with problems with allergies oftentimes have real problems when they fly. Um, vertigo. Uh, in the nose, congestion, runny nose, a lot of postnasal discharge and uh, drainage, which you'll know because you're clearing your throat all the time. Sinus problems, nasal polyps. In the mouth, you can have itching. Geographic tongue, which looks like live different areas of the map on a tongue instead of a nice pink tongue. Canker sores, itchy throat, throat clearing, cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, recurrent respiratory infections. So these are common symptoms of environmental allergies. Now, the food allergies will have all those possibly, but as we said, because you've got these immune complexes that are being deposited anywhere in the body, you're going to get headaches, ADHD, brain fog, insomnia, depression, fatigue, digestive problems, stomach aches, nausea, diarrhea, reflux. There's any number of things. Now, some of these are really interesting. Bedwetting in kids. Oftentimes, five, six-year-olds still wetting the bed. It's food allergies. 
itchy vaginitis instead of an infection, oftentimes a food allergy, painful bladder, muscle and joint pain, stiffness, and the skin things that we talked about, psoriasis, autoimmune disorder. I'd like to talk a little bit about testing and especially about the kind of testing that we do at our office. Um, and I, I'm being brief with this because there are so many different kinds of tests that you know, it could get pretty boring after a while, so I'm gonna to try to keep it limited. If we talk about blood testing, you got your immediate, your type one, and you got your type two. And so you can use type one, we'll measure antibodies against environmental and food allergies. It's useful when you have kids that are too young. You don't want to skin test a, a new, newborn. It's going to be uh, very difficult. Um, and try to skin test a five-year-old who doesn't want to be skin tested, not going to happen. You have people that are very fragile. You have people with asthma that if, if you tested them and it provoked their symptoms to be worse, a blood test might be a safer way to do it. And also, if you're looking for food allergies and the person's had anaphylactic reactions before or you're worried about it, a blood test is a much safer way to go. Now, in terms of what IgG, IgG antibodies, remember, are the ones that cause the immune complexes. It's the one that cause delayed reactions. And for a lot of people, this is the only way you're going to figure it out. It's on a blood test. And so you can measure the antibodies against the different foods. It's useful for looking for delayed hypersensitivity when it's, it's not clear from the symptoms. And a lot of times it's not clear because the symptoms are so general. Probably the best way of looking for food tests, uh, food allergies, is an elimination challenge diet. And this is the holistic gold standard for diagnosing food allergies. And what you do in a case, it's great, useful for the delayed food. It's more accurate than blood and skin testing. And you would never do this with a type food one food. You know, you're not going to take some kid who had an anaphylactic reaction and say, here, have these peanuts. But what you do is you remove the most allergic foods for about two weeks. And what happens is you become very sensitive to those foods, but you feel a lot better. And then you reintroduce the foods one at a time. And when you hit the food or foods that are a problem, your symptoms will come back and oftentimes they're more dramatic. You can also use this as a, a way of uh, w when, you, when you do the blood testing, too, because when you do an elimination challenge diet, you're talking about wheat, dairy, eggs, soy, corn, yeast, tomatoes, citrus. There's a lot of foods, and a lot of people, they're just not up for taking all that out of their f diet at one time. But if you get food test results back that show that you have high IgG levels to certain foods, you can take those foods out for a couple of weeks and then rechallenge them. I always think that it's a good idea to rechallenge the food after about two weeks because none of these tests are perfectly accurate. And you could be taking some very healthy foods out of your diet and you feel better after you take five foods away. But if it's only two of them, there's nothing unhealthy about, inherently unhealthy about eggs or tomatoes or something like this. You'd like those to be in the diet if you can. And that brings me to skin testing. Now, there's Different kinds of skin testing, I'm going to talk about two kinds. Prick testing is used by most allergists, and it's the same thing a conventional allergist would have is the same thing that we do. You prick the skin with a drop of what you're looking for, okay? It could be uh, food, it could be pets, it could be dust mites, molds, whatever. And you look for swelling and redness, and that would indicate that there's a, an allergy. But it's a qualitative measurement. It doesn't quantify how sensitive that person is necessarily. And so oftentimes we rely on what we call interdermal testing. And as opposed to just a little prick, now you're introducing a shot of something into the arm. And you raise a nice round little bump and you watch that. And if, you, if that bump grows, you can measure it very precisely. Now you've got a very specific idea about how sensitive that person is. So if I put a prick of cat on my arm and it doesn't grow, well, maybe I put a stronger dose here, and I keep going until I either am not allergic or I get a weak reaction. Well, that tells me where my sensitivity is. If I get a big swelling here of cat, I know I'm allergic. I'll put a weaker dose here, and I'll keep going weak until I stop reacting. So for anything that you're allergic to, you get a customized picture of how allergic you are to any given thing. That gives you a great place to start for treatment. which is where we are now. 
So the best treatment is to avoid the thing to begin with. And we haven't really talked about chemicals very much, but chemicals could be part of this picture. And so you want to you want to eliminate what you can. Okay, you might eliminate the foods you're sensitive to. You could get an air filter, filter the air, get rid of the allergens that you're allergic to. If you've got mold in your house, big problem. And I think there was a speaker earlier in September talked about mold illness. You got to get rid of it. Okay, eating organic foods, avoiding dental amalgams, the mercury using green household cleaners. There's any number of things you can do to avoid allergens. And everything you, can, you do can be helpful. And I didn't make a slide of this, but if you think about an allergic person like a rain barrel, if you fill up that rain barrel with the things the person's allergic to and it overflows, you have symptoms. If you can get to the surface or below that, you're not gonna have symptoms. So everything you take out of there, you're moving down. And that's where the testing comes in. You identify what's in that rain barrel and you remove those, you can become symptom free without treatment. Well, treatment by this. There are a number of supplements that will reduce symptoms and reduce inflammation. Now, you notice it's, I'm saying reduce symptoms and reducing inflammation. I'm not saying curing. So, this is a treatment using supplements instead of medications. Quercetin, very interesting. It's a food derived bioflavonoid that prevents your mast cells from breaking apart and releasing the histamine. So you're keeping the horses in the barn. Using an antihistamine is gathering up the horses after they're loose. Fish oil, flaxseed oil, these omega-3 oils are anti-inflammatory. And they can kind of bring down the level of inflammation inside your body in a person who is prone to inflammation. Nettles, coleus, there are a number of herbs that are really good for reducing allergies. And there are any number of homeopathic remedies. These are great for people that are sensitive to all kinds of things, because very few people will react to this. And I'm sure they've got some of these at Hopkinton Drug and, and other kind of forward-thinking uh, apothecaries. Medications, well, antihistamines. Who hasn't heard of Benadryl? And you got Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, and all the generics. Decongestants, nasal sprays. You got steroids, you got antihistamine. This is an interesting one, chromalin keeps the mast cells from breaking apart. So now you're talking about preventive. So this is not just, this actually is preventive right here. For eczema, you've got topical steroid creams. For asthma, you've got inhalers, steroids, Singular, Spiriva. There's any number of different drugs you use to, to control the illness. Now, one of the things that I really wanted to focus tonight on is immunotherapy. This is the only way that you can actually reverse allergy and, and cure yourself, okay? Curing meaning that you are actually getting to a point where your immune system is no longer reacting to a non-harmful substance. Traditional allergy shots do this by starting at a certain point with weak doses of your allergens and then you increase weekly and over time you become tolerant to all these things that you're being exposed to. The new kid on the block is sublingual allergy drops, actually developed in the 30s, but never really caught on until the Europeans started reintroducing, they started, started uh, manufacturing these about 20 years ago. Over there, a lot of people were dying from allergy shots because they were being administered in ways that were not very appropriate. And this is a much safer way. And then you got the oral food challenges, and these have really come back into favor. I don't know if people heard about like, uh, reintroducing peanuts and, and uh, desensitizing in the office, milk, these types of things. And some fairly serious uh, food reactions are being treated this way. These things here desensitize, which means that you can tolerate now exposures to these things, your allergic substances, without reacting, okay? Your immune system actually is retrained, and that generally takes years. Neutralization is a different type of, of treatment, and it, it's very quick. Neutralization starts at that point for every different allergen that you can tolerate. In other words, when I was talking about finding the quantitative point, for anything you're allergic to, if you go weak enough, you're gonna find a point where you don't react. If you take that substance as a shot or drops under your tongue, about 80 or 90% of the time, you're gonna react less to those things, and within about three to four weeks. And those are safe to do at home, and uh, work pretty well, but they don't desensitize you. You gotta keep doing it as, as long as you're being exposed and you gotta be retested 
frequently because you have to get it precise. So let's talk about the desensitization a little bit. I think I got some stuff. This is my favorite, this sublingual desensitization. These two different bottles um, from this manufacturer, this would be for environmental, this would be for foods. You have to use a lot more food in a bottle. But you put this on your tooth and you squirt it under your tongue three times a day. That's what lasts about three months. Next bottle, a little stronger. Next bottle, a little stronger. So as you're doing this, you're constantly allowing yourself to be less sensitive and less sensitive. And eventually you'll get up to a strong dose where you're tolerating a high amount and you're not reacting. That takes a uh, variable length for different people. If you start at a point where you're very sensitive and you've got very weak amounts, you've got a long way to go, it might take a couple years. If you're talking about a person who's weakly allergic, well, in a year you're up to the full dose. However, you don't have to get to a full dose before you feel better. Some people feel better before the first three months are over. Most people will feel a little bit better by the end of six months and almost everyone by nine months. The foods take longer and they're much more difficult to deal with. But it's pretty amazing that you can desensitize to foods. I never knew about this until about 10 years ago. And I was introduced to this idea and I thought it was an amazing idea, but I didn't know where anyone was doing this. And I just fortuitously found out about it. And I had a couple kids who had autism. I couldn't change their diets because they wouldn't eat. And so taking them off gluten and dairy was not an option. So I thought, well, let's give this a try. And within six months to a year, their symptoms were getting better. In a year and a half or so, their symptoms were gone. I couldn't believe it. And they're eating the foods as they go along. And that makes sense because if you're desensitizing to environmental things, you're not going to eliminate dust. You're not going to eliminate molds. You're desensitizing even with exposure. Now, if you stop eating the food, you'll get better faster. So what do the sh studies show in terms of the difference between doing it under the tongue and doing the shots? Well, this is a lot more convenient. You do this at home. You've got to go into the doctor's office every week for a shot. That's one of the main reasons why people stop allergy shots. It's just too inconvenient. Fewer adverse reactions. Lots of times as you're advancing on your allergy shots, because of the imprecision of the, test, of the, the testing methods that are used conventionally, you can start getting reactions. You get itchy bumps. Sometimes you have to back down. If you go away for a couple weeks, you have to back down on your treatment or you get big reactions. You're not going to get reactions with this. Very rare. And if you do, you can just readjust the concentration and start another bottle safely at home. And this, I think, is, is really an interesting point. I think that we're going to find out that the sublingual treatment will actually create a better outcome. And why would that be? Well, when you think about an allergy shot, you're puncturing through the skin and you're, going into the, and you're introducing things into the bloodstream. Well, your immune system in terms of your bloodstream is there's a foreigner in the body, attack it. And you're trying to quiet that down. So you're going against the body's innate reaction. When you introduce something under the tongue, you're actually working with the body. The body is predisposed to tolerate things when presented under the tongue. And you think about that. What does a baby do with everything it touches? It puts it in its mouth. It's desensitizing itself to its environment. And so this is actually old school, and it works really well. Um, it's incredibly well tolerated. I'm really excited about this. So that's kind of the basics. I thought what might be interesting is to, is to share a couple examples of how this might work. Okay, how would a practice, what would it look like? And so I, I picked a few cases here. This just says, we've exhausted all conventional measures. One last desperate option is to put you on an alternative medicine that has a 96% success rate. So NH, 18-year-old high school senior, she had the allergy trifecta. She had asthma, eczema, and hay fever. These are the same thing, just manifesting in different places. They can be caused by the same uh, allergens. As a matter of fact, you oftentimes will see a, a person who's an adult. They started out with eczema when they were a baby. They developed asthma and later hay fever or any combination of those things. Eczema was her worst problem. She was really itchy. She was socially self-conscious because it was on her face, it was in her scalp. Um, she was constantly using uh, steroid creams. 
Her hay fever, mostly in the spring, she had itchy eyes, sneezing, runny nose. She was using daily antihistamines. And her asthma was seasonal, so in the spring she had to use her inhaler all the time. But any time she exercised and played sports, she had to use her inhaler. And in the wintertime, if she was out in the cold air, she oftentimes had to use it. She got three different medications here. So what did the testing show? Well, when we skin tested her, she had dust mites, she had tree pollens, which explains her spring symptoms, ragweed, which would start, you know, early August and go through September into October. And um, her food showed a number of foods, wheat, peanut, yeast, tomato, peach, carrot, apple, celery, and several nuts. And it was interesting because she had a combination. She had some IgG delayed foods and she had some IgE immediate foods, even though there were only a couple foods that ever gave her any symptoms. So stepping back to that type one allergy, you eat a food, you break out in hives. Well, let's say that it's a, a, a weak allergen. Maybe you don't even know it, but it's acting to fill up that rain barrel. So she had a number of different things. What did we do? Well, we, we, she, these people like to do as much as they could naturally. So she started on quercetin and fish oil. We tried, she tried eliminating these foods, but she's a senior in high school. I mean, come on, that's not gonna happen. Can't go out for pizza. Um, and we started environmental sublingual drops and then later followed it with food. So she was on both food and environmental desensitization. Within nine months, she only had occasional flares up, flare ups of her eczema. And it was like for a couple days. She, very, she had stopped using the steroid cream. She had completely stopped her antihistamines, even in the spring. And she rarely needed her albuterol. She was really happy. Each one's getting a little more complicated. So RJ was a 10-year-old. And this kid was complicated. He had asthma. He'd been hospitalized several times. He was on oral steroids a couple times a year. He used Flovent inhaler, Singular, Albuterol, and he was unable to play sports because he just couldn't exercise without um, triggering his asthma. He was congested. He had all these symptoms. He was using daily antihistamines and a, a nasal uh, steroid spray. His eczema was, was really bad. I mean, his, his skin was not only full of eczema, but he had scratched it so much that it was infected and he was constantly on antibiotics and antibiotic creams just to control it. And he was on daily steroids. He was sick, he had lots of ear infections when he was young. By the time I saw him, he was having sinus infections and probably six to eight courses of antibiotics per year. He had a number of food allergies that they had already dis uh, discovered. He had hives, he had angioedema at times, diarrhea, stomach aches. He was still wetting his bed at age 10. On a regular basis, he couldn't go to other people's houses for sleepovers. He had been constipated from birth. He was using a, a stimulant, laxative, plus a stool softener. And he was embarrassed. He was socially isolated. And he was the nicest kid. He was so cheerful. So when we skin tested him, he had dust, dust mites, molds, pets, pollens. He had the ball of the whole thing. He had a number of foods that hadn't been determined, especially the dairy and the wheat, very common, egg and soy. Corn and soy are the hardest things to avoid. They're in more products than anything else. When you lick a stamp, you're being exposed to corn syrup. When you uh, lick an envelope, I mean, it's like an industrial product. It's almost impossible to get that out of your diet. And it's not even listed as corn. It's listed as dextrose or it's under uh, starch or any number of things. Hydrolyzed protein is oftentimes what soy is. So it's very hard to determine this. And the things like wheat and gluten, well, we know that those are really difficult right now. But you can have a certain amount of gluten in the product and not have to list it as gluten-free. And in the last couple of years, the food industry has actually been successful at being able to put more gluten in the product and still not have to list it in, in the product. So we started him on allergy shots, the neutralization shots. And he was getting between one and three times weekly. What's interesting about these types of shots is instead of coming in every week, you regulate it by the frequency of taking the shot. Now, the shot has the concentration of each thing that you're allergic to at the highest dose that you can tolerate without a reaction. You could do 10 a day. You're not going to react. But it makes you feel better. He was able to eliminate a lot of these foods.
So over time, his cough went away, the breathlessness and wheezing, he stopped the flow vent, the singular, the albuterol, he started playing sports. This kid was a lot happier. He, he, his allergy symptoms actually resolved by the time the allergy shots, we got the right dose. He stopped his medications. His eczema was still a problem. Um, it, it was a lot better, but it, it wasn't perfect. He hardly ever needed antibiotics. His, his bedwetting, gone. His constipation, once in a while, they used some Senna. And really importantly, he lost a lot of weight. He became socially involved. This kid blossomed. It was, it was fantastic. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about DF. She was a 30-year-old, and she had a number of problems, too. And some of these go beyond what you might think of in terms of allergies. She's got the allergies and the asthma. She uses Flonase. She's on antihistamines. Uh, a steroid um, uh, treatment for the lungs. She's got the albuterol, and she's had oral steroids in the past. She's got a condition with her food allergies called oral allergy syndrome. And this is a, a situation where you eat something and you get some itching in your mouth, maybe a little swelling, but it never progresses to hives or anything, and it's always gone within an hour. Typically pitted fruits, peaches, apples, pears, and carrots and celery. You can get it with nuts also. She did have it with nuts. And she had mouth itching, and her lips would get a little swollen. Irritable bowel syndrome and reflux. But she had diarrhea, cramping, gas, bloating, heartburn. And she was on omeprazole, which is, is really a bad drug to be on for very long. It blocks all your stomach acid. Now, stomach acid has some very useful purposes. It's the first line of defense for germs that are coming into your body. It kills them. So that's how you're protecting yourself. Second thing is, that stomach acid digests protein and fibers. So you're digesting your food. It, it's also necessary for you to, to make vitamin B, B12 and to absorb it. So long-term use of this can lead to osteoporosis, nutritional deficiencies, lots of problems. She also had re the recurrent respiratory infection. She was on antibiotics a lot. She had some, so with her, she decided she wanted to do an elimination challenge diet. She found that during the two weeks when she was on the elimination, she had more energy, less gas and bloating, her cramping and diarrhea resolved, she had less sinus headaches, asthma, allergy symptoms, and she identified that of all those foods that she took away, gluten and dairy were the only two that really caused the symptoms. So one of the nice things about rechallenging is she could eat all those other foods. And when we skin tested her, dust, dust mites, molds, pollens, pets, that's pretty much everything. And she went off gluten and dairy, and she got allergy shots for these allergens. All the GI symptoms resolved. Oral allergy syndrome, thought to be a permanent situation. She was able to reintroduce a few of the foods. Others that she ate caused less symptoms. Reflux, she got off the omeprazole. Her allergies and asthma improved on the diet, and she was able to wean off the albuterol and the antihistamines after we started the shots and her infections virtually disappeared. You think about the difference this makes in a person's life. So just in conclusion, how is the allergy pro practice that we have at the Rothfeld Center unique? Well, first of all, the goal. We're trying to reduce inflammation throughout the body. We're not just trying to treat symptoms. We're trying to restore the immune system to normal function. Every treatment plan is customized to the person. We're going to integrate the results of the allergy testing with a number of factors. Environment, genetic predisposition, digestive problems, autoimmune disorders, stress. And it usually involves a multifaceted approach. So environmental food, chemical exposure avoidance, home and work modifications. Lifestyle modifications, diet and exercise. Didn't even talk about that, but amazingly effective. Nutritional supplements, medications. We use medications if we have to. That's the nice part about being integrative. You use what works the best. Oftentimes, you start with your medications, and people can go off them as they get better. And it all depends on how much the person wants to work. Some people feel fine at feeling 70% better. They'll take two out of their five medications. They've lost three. They're happy where they are, and to do any more is too much work for them. So they can find their own level. Uh, uh, Co-treatment of other medical problems. Treatment of infections and toxicity. 
and target immunotherapy, either sublingual or injection. Well, we don't actually look that bad in person, <laughs> but this is our team. Whoa, that's brutal. And this is how you can contact us. Okay, we take new patients, and uh, I would encourage anyone who would like to, to to make an appointment and come in and see what we have to offer. So that's it. That's what I have to to present. Um, and I'd love to answer any questions any, anyone has. Um, because this is being televised, we're, well, I've been asked to have people speak into the microphone. The microphone won't sound any different, but it does go onto the TV so that we can, uh, uh, we're live streaming this so that people are watching can understand what the question is too. Any questions? A lot of times we hear about uh, leaky gut and how that um, can cause some allergies and things like that. How does leaky gut, how do you get leaky gut? Can you, can you tell us how okay. to avoid yeah. that? Um, well, everyone's born with leaky gut. Okay, what is leaky gut? It's a horrible sound, but it, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Okay, let's imagine that this is a cell that's in my intestine. Okay, I've got these little microvilli to, for absorption and the food's coming along here. Well, to get into my body, this food has to be digested down to a small enough molecule that it can actually pass through the cell. The next cell is held so tightly that nothing can leak in between. Now, you're born with leaky gut, and that's how mother's milk antibodies can get into the system, because these are large molecules, and they wouldn't even get into the, protect the baby if you, if you weren't like this. But over the course of the first year, you, your own de immune system develops. You don't need that anymore. You seal this up. Now you should have an intact uh, a gut. If that doesn't happen, you're going to have problems. But at any point along the way, something could happen. Medications, food allergies, food poisoning, really common. Uh, stomach flu, um, poor diet, uh, any number of different parasites, OK? can now start causing problems, food allergies. And what happens is you disrupt this, this seal here, and you start developing a gap. Now things that are not being absorbed can actually get in. Now they generally don't get in the bloodstream because the immune system's right here. So you're pounding on the immune system, and that's causing inflammation. And, and so once you've established this, it can be its own thing. You could remove the thing that caused it, but you still have this condition. And so the leaky gut is a situation where not only do you have a lot of symptoms, but now you're allowing extraneous things, possible access into the body. So you've lost your integrity. You're, you're going to eat about 30 tons of food in a normal lifetime. And that's really uh, what you're trying to protect against. About 70% of your total immune system is used lining the gut. Because as we developed, we didn't have refrigerators and processed food. You know, we were eating some pretty rank stuff. And we had to protect ourselves from that. So once you get this leaky gut, it can go on by itself. Now, the nice thing about it is that these cells replace themselves every three to five days. So if you can eliminate the problem that caused it, let's say Hurricane Katrina, and your small intestinal wall are the levees along the Mississippi River and the Gulf, the hurricane damages that, and now you've got problems in the city, which would be your internal, your liver, your heart, that kind of thing. Well, once you take care of the hurricane, be it the food allergies, uh, uh, bad germs that there with medications, then you can work to, to heal the leaky gut. But it's very hard to heal it if you're still exposed to the things that are causing the problem to begin with. So I see it as a secondary problem. Is that helpful? Any other questions? I have a question about cortisol. I'm, watch, I'm reading all of these different cases that you're talking about. Do you ever test the cortisol levels in these, these people that are ill, that come in ill? Well, yeah, let's talk functionally. Um, I do that commonly, okay? So the question is, do, we, do I test cortisol? And um, I could have a long discussion with my friend Ken Blanchard here about cortisol, but um, the cortisol is the, is, the, is the main, what I would consider the main hormone that the adrenal gland makes. Your adrenal gland is your stress gland, okay? It's about the size of a walnut. 
and it produces epinephrine, which is adrenaline, and cortisol, and DHEA, and any number of hormones. Well, cortisol regulates blood sugar, it regulates your immune system, and it, it's what gets you through times of stress, okay? If you're sitting on the beach with your mint julep, maybe you make 30, 40 milligrams of cortisol. You get hit by a bus, your house burns down, you lose your job, you might make 200 milligrams. You have to have that ability to regulate. Now, we're not built to be under stress all the time. We're built to be like the zebra. We're chill on the savanna. Lion appears, you either survive or you don't. Maximum stress. As Soon as that threat's over, you're back chilling on the savanna. But we live in a constant stress situation. It's very wearing on the adrenal glands. Well, the adrenal glands are controlled by your brain, your hypothalamus, your pituitary gland. With constant stress, you, you disrupt the messaging. The problem isn't usually the adrenal glands, the problem is the messaging. And it dials down and you don't respond. Now, what can happen is that when stress happens and you need more, you don't have that ability to generate more cortisol. What are symptoms? Fatigue, non-restful sleep, cold sensitivity, thirst, salt cravings, dizziness when you stand up, low blood pressure, frequent infections, exercise intolerance, hypoglycemia. There's a lot of things that can be caused. And so when we see symptoms like that, we're oftentimes tempted to t test for it. But it's almost always a problem because of the stresses. And you want to identify what were the stresses that caused it so you can eliminate it. It's like the leaky gut. You, what caused it? You know, if, if you don't uh, change the things that are causing the problem, you're not going to be able to help very much. Is that helpful? Hi. Can you explain what asthma is? Because I thought it was always a serious permanent condition, and how would it relate to allergies, and how does it get helped through your program? Great question. The question was explaining asthma and how it, it, she was thinking that it was a permanent condition. How can you reverse that or maybe live without symptoms kind of thing? Okay. Well, asthma is an allergic condition. In your lungs, you're reacting to something, and what's happening is a couple of things. I don't have a diagram here, but let's imagine that, that the tubule of a lung, you've got your windpipe. You're going to branch into, into your lungs. It's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get out to the very end where the oxygen gets into the body. It's like a bunch of grapes. Well, that last little tube is where the problem is. And if you cut it and looked at it, it's like a hose. Okay, that wall is muscle. Now, when I, if I'm allergic to cats and I get around the cat, what's going to happen is the muscle is going to go into spasm and it's just going to close like this. So it's like breathing through a straw. You can't breathe in or out very well. The albuterol, your rescue inhaler, relaxes the muscle, go back to here. But if you're getting stimulated with your allergen all the time, the wall becomes thick, it gets swollen. So even though you might relax the muscle, the wall is swollen. You still can't breathe that well, and that's why you use steroids. But if you don't take care of the problem, what's going to happen with, with, is that your lungs are going to become more fibrotic. It remodels itself. And it's harder and harder and harder to get rid of it. But if you can get rid of the triggers so that when, when things happen, you don't start that inflammatory process, you won't have symptoms. Is that helpful? Once it's into the fiber stage, is that irre irre irreversible? No, well, uh, to some degree, but you can almost always feel better. I mean, think about a person with, with emphysema. You've gone really far down the line by the time you get emphysema. But th those things, not reversible, but you can control it and you can manage it. And you can almost always feel better by doing certain things. I have a question. Can you describe the difference between asthma and emphysema, symptom-wise? Sure. A uh, person with emphysema has destroyed part of their lung, okay? So instead of having all these nice little pockets where you've got air exchange, you've got open areas where nothing's going on. And your, your chest is gonna be huge because you're working so hard to get oxygen in there. Um, oftentimes, uh, and it's a permanent situation. So if you're compromised in how much oxygen you can get in, you're gonna get tired when you exert yourself. Now, you can maybe be a little bit better if you take some steroids or you do X, Y, or Z. But that's a permanent situation. With asthma, that's going to be dependent on what your exposure is. You have a person who feels great in the winter. They don't need anything. And then springtime comes, 
and they've got all kinds of problems. Now, a person with emphysema with no uh, allergies, they're going to be the same all the time. A person with asthma might be totally different at these times. But they oftentimes coexist. Question here. Okay, hang on one second. What can you tell us about an allergy against cold? Against cold? Yes, cold. Like cold weather? Ye yes. Cold temperatures. Cold temperatures. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing about cold is that it's the temperature that's your trigger now. It's not an allergy, but it's still causing the muscle in the lungs to go into spasm. And with that one, you can use your rescue inhaler, your albuterol, and that's going to relax the muscle. Because the cold air is not like an allergen, and it's different. Because you're not going to develop that thickening of the wall of the, of, the, of the breathing tubes so that you need steroids and stuff like that. And as soon as you get into warm, air, you're generally going to reverse that. Now, that's not always the case, but generally, it's, it's always dependent upon that exposure. And usually, you can reverse that with the albuterol. Now, if you have allergies also, and your rain barrel is full, you may become much less sensitive to the cold by taking care of your allergies. My granddaughter is 15 years old, and uh, she was just diagnosed with cold allergies. And cold allergies or cold asthma? Allergy. Uh, she allergy has hives, against right? Against cold. And she'll get hives? Um, her face is starting to swell. Yeah. That's a, almost like an autoimmune situation, where the body is actually attacking itself in those situations. But the cold is actually causing the the immune, the mast cells and stuff to release their histamine and things like that in the presence of a cold. It's like an irritant, okay? It's more like she's being irritated and that's causing it as opposed to an allergy, okay? Like if you put ice cubes on your skin or you put dry ice, everyone's gonna hurt at some point, okay? And you're gonna, it's not gonna be good for you. And so for her, she's just very sensitive to the irritant of the cold. And it's causing those cells in her skin to, to release the histamine, and she's having a reaction. It's not really an allergy. It's more of a, well, it's cold-induced. It's just different. It's much harder to treat. Can you treat it? You'd have uh, to look at the... going into a, a warm room, is there anything else you can do? There are things, but it's probably beyond the scope of this talk to really go into that kind of thing. But I think it's pretty difficult to treat. Thank you. Patty? Hi, Dr. Bingham. I just wanted to see if you wanted to talk a little bit about all the allergy symptoms that happen after you uh, contract Lyme, if you want to get into any of that at all. Um, I didn't have any of those allergies until I was diagnosed with the Lyme. So you're really opening up a box here, aren't you? <laughs> well, this is a very difficult, the question is, what about allergies that start after people get Lyme disease? Well, Lyme disease is, is it's epidemic. And I think that um, it's an illness that really impacts the immune system. And the longer you have it undiagnosed and untreated, the more it affects your immune system. And so if you don't take care of it in the first six months to a year, you're going to have some immune problems. And so you can have all kinds of stuff start. Besides the fact that when Lyme is growing in your body, it's creating toxins, okay, poisons or whatever. And those poisons, for some people, are more than they can tolerate. Maybe any poison that you get into your body is going to be absorbed into your system. Lyme disease is going to be very neurotoxic. It affects the central nervous system. And if you have those, most people, when they acquire those, your immune system will identify it, break it down, and eliminate it. But if your immune system is compromised, it's just going to build up. And you see a lot of people with Lyme disease, they've got cognitive dysfunction. They've got brain fog. They don't think right. It's because they're poisoned. And, it, and if you affect the, the immune system, you can become sensitized. Um, it's a horrible illness. But it's treatable. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, 
Um, I have a question. I have two elderly parents, 85 and 87, and uh, both, one is worse off with dementia than the other. Is there something we should be aware of for them as they age and this disease progresses as far as allergies or asthma related? So the question is, in uh, uh, older people or anyone with dementia, are there things that we need to be concerned about around allergy? Are these people who have allergies already, or? So the question is, how? What can you do about dementia? Yeah, no. My mom has some allergies. Uh, she's 85. She has some allergies that she, you know, can't eat certain things or just has, uh, like environmental allergies. I just want to know if there's anything to be aware of as they continue to progress here. What may come up, if anything, or if you know of anything? Well, my experience with dementia is that basically people forget. And they, they forget a lot of the things that were very protective of themselves. So they might forget that they can't eat a certain food. So, you know, having the food in the, in the house, not a good idea. They might forget that in the springtime they have to have their window shut and they have to have the air conditioner on. So it's a matter of, of almost like thinking about them as children. You have to protect them like you would a child. child. And you know, to a large degree, we haven't been very successful at reversing dementia. I mean, there are some promising things on the, on the horizon, but there's nothing out right now that really works very well. And so avoidance in, and, and uh, constant uh, supervision, the best I can, there's nothing that you would use specially at that point. You just have to protect people. And getting them to take their medications is oftentimes not very easy e either. So as people decline, it's a trade-off. How much are you going to push people to do the healthy things where they're at a point where they really don't care? Well, that, those, are t those are really difficult questions. Where everyone, every family and every individual have to battle with that. Um, you know Kelly's whole history. Um, have you tried, or has anyone you know tried, with um, fecal implant to heal the gut to help with the food allergies? Okay, so now we're moving into the more gross section. But the question was, been, have, have we ever tried fecal transplants to help people with food allergies? Yeah, um, I think this is really promising. The more we learn about the gut, just step back a second. An adult has about four to five pounds of germs in their intestines, almost completely in the, col in the colon. 500 to 1,000 different strains of germs. And when things are balanced, those germs are growing and making a lot of waste products, which are vitamins and nutrients and protection against bad germs. It's a true symbiotic relationship. You feed them, they protect you. When you take antibiotics or something dis disrupts that, and, and some of the good bacteria die, that's not going to stay vacant. Something else will fill that void. And whatever grows is going to produce waste products. And those waste products can be toxic and can be very uh, damaging to the, to the colon. It could cause the colon to stop working, paralyze it. It could cause uh, those toxins will get through the wall of the intestine into the body and cause all kinds of problems. So in the last few years, it's been thought that maybe one solution would be to implant healthy bacteria into the colon. And hopefully that would take over and replace the, the diseased bacteria, if you want to put it that way. And the studies are really promising. Um, you know, once you pass the gross out factor uh, and the fact that there are some real things you have to worry about because, you know, guaranteeing the safety of your, of your source is going to be really important in this situation. The FDA has been very careful to limit what you can use this for. In this area of the country, the only indica uh, indication for using the fecal transplants is C. difficile, which is an antibiotic uh, caused uh, uh, infection of the, of the intestine, which is very difficult to manage. And people can die from it, but basically they just kind of waste a lot. But it's very hard. I think that a lot of people would get benefit from this if this could be really studied and it was given as an option. Okay, if there was a capsule you could take, if there were, uh, well, let's not get into the details, but, but I think it is promising. No, C. diff is a complication of taking antibiotics. Oh, right. 
And so if you get that illness, it can be very hard to treat, but it's been found that this treatment is good for it. But it's been found to be very useful for ulcerative colitis and uh, uh, Crohn's disease. I've seen people use it for rheumatoid arthritis or other problems too. Well, that's, that's too general of a question, Tracy. You, you, have to, you have to still have to get rid of the other things that are causing the leaky gut. But it can be a major factor to help get a person over a hump and or over an obstacle. Well, the main issue, one of the main issues with Kelly is no matter what type of probiotic and what level of dosages we go up to, no matter what, when she's tested, she still has no probiotics in her. So it could be something to look into for her. Yeah, I think it would be, I think that would make sense. Do you know anybody that you could send me to? Probably? Yeah, we could talk afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, Dr. Van. Hey, um, my question is about whether there is any role in the, your treatments for um, infrared sauna uh, the use of that. Is, do you have any experience with that, or do you know if that might be helpful for allergies? Well, the, the answer is yes in selected cases. I mean, I think that, again, what a holistic approach does is it tries to respect and understand the uniqueness of each person, as opposed to saying, well, everyone with asthma gets this, or everyone with strep throat gets this is you have to consider why does a person have something. Now, the use of infrared saunas is a detoxification treatment because the skin is an organ of detoxification. You can detoxify through your skin. As a matter of fact, a lot of acne and a lot of these skin, skin ills is actually the body's attempt to, de to get rid of stuff through the skin. Well, sweating is a very good way, and the infrared sauna is a great way to sweat. But let's say the person has, is kind of borderline and they're pretty fragile and you start detoxifying. Well, now you're mobilizing a lot of toxins in the body. You could get much sicker. So you just have to be careful. You start with a couple minutes, you see how you feel. Epsom salt baths very good to detoxify. But you have to be careful. Let's say you have really bad eczema or something and you all of a sudden start detoxifying. Well, the skin is already your sensitive place. If you start going through toxins into the skin, it can make it worse. Uh, as you've talked about the various allergies, it, it, uh, I think most of us in medicine have had uh, index cases, people who showed us something that we, th we never knew about before, and we carry that through our whole careers. And I'm, I'm thinking about a guy that I, I treated when I was in doing primary care right. who had severe asthma uh, at least every other month, emergency room, course of prednisone, one after another, and I don't know how I got onto the, uh, you know, the possible allergy to dyes and the things, but of course I deal in thyroid. And the guy was taking 100 micrograms of Synthroid, which has yellow six and yellow 10. And I, I don't know how I got on this idea, but I said, why, why don't we try giving you two of the 50s, the dye-free pills? I don't think the guy ever had another, uh, another asthma attack. And uh, there was another young man worked at our hospital at Newton Wellesley who every year would have horrible coughs and bringing up phlegm, and I would give him antibiotics, not you know, thinking I'm treating something. And then it turned out that his, his psychiatrist was giving him 50 of Zoloft, which has a blue dye, which you know, certainly dealing with the thyroid pills, to me, the blue dye is the worst allergen of all. And so I, I just, I gave, him, I gave him a prescription for the 100, which is dye-free, told him take a half, a half a pill a day, gone just like that. And I think, you know, those, those are the easy things to do. The stuff you're talking about, elimination, it's too complicated for me, but if somebody's got some kind of something going on with them and they have a pill with dyes, my feeling is get rid of the dyes and, and does, anything, does something good happen? And I deal with that all the time because with the thyroid pills, they've all got dyes except for the 50s. So if that's for 25 years, I have people taking only the 50s, even if they have to take three pills a day. And, at least that's something easy to do. Now, I, you know, it's interesting that in the European Union, they don't allow these dyes. They're eliminated. All those pills are dye-free. They're, they're identified with a letter or, or a number or something. And I think it's long overdue 
that we get rid of these dyes and pills because all they do is cause problems. The problem is that in our country, if we know what would happen if somebody introduced a bill like that, million dollar a year lawyers would start screaming bloody murders and constitution and bill of rights and well paid prostitute witnesses would say, oh, there's no evidence that, that, that causes any harm, so the dye manufacturers will keep doing the same thing. But that's an easy way. The thing is, if you do it and nothing happens, then it didn't work. And you're on to something else. But that's easy to do. Get rid of dyes. Ken, your cynicism is showing. <laughs> uh, I get more, the older I get, the more cynical I get about everything. Well, you were the one who taught me about the 50 milligram thyroid. And then you taught me about tyrosine, which is a type of thyroid that doesn't have preservatives yeah. in it. And these stories are, are everywhere. And, and you know, I didn't even bring up the, f the fact that, you know, p come in with a person with hives or all kinds of problems. Sometimes they're already taking a medication that's causing it. And all you have to do is stop taking stuff as opposed to trying to, to, to take something else. And I'll just share one story. You had a woman who came in, she had this horrible rash over her body every two weeks that would, no, every month that would last for about a week and a half, every month. And we did allergy testing, we did food testing, we did elimination challenge, we could not figure out what it was. And there's a lab I use every now and then because it costs a lot of money, but it looks at chemicals, it looks at all these kinds of things. So we did the test, it came out with peppermint. Well, her boyfriend visited once a month and she made peppermint schnapps fudge. And every month she broke out for a week and a half and once she stopped that, her allergies were gone. Now, those are things that people figure out you know, or you don't figure out. It's, but it's a perfect example of things that can be the most simple, simple thing in the world. So uh, I, I think that when I was trained, I was trained that 80% of people who have hives never figure out what causes the hives. And I would say that for most people, it's 20% because if you help them, they, if, if you help them to believe that they can figure it out, they will, as opposed to being told that they can't. And so in, in holistic medicine, and with the whole idea of becoming more independent is that people are encouraged to be partners in their own health. And health is not about taking a pill. Health is about a lifestyle. It's about choices. And I think that one of the things that, that I love about this kind of medicine is that you're helping people to help themselves. Yes? So uh, do you do genetic testing? Do we have the... Actually, two things to say. One thing is that the, the blood work that you had, the 96 um, food issues, that is very helpful to see what you're allergic to in black and white because I've been on this path for a very long time, and finally seeing it in black and white allowed me to start that elimination process. So I'm, I'm grateful that you do that. But um, for a regular appointment, do you do genetic testing also at the Rothfeld Center? We do, and that's kind of like the wave of the future, I think. You know, it's, it hasn't been very long that we've been able to get a reading on everyone's genome. And you can, you can measure all your genes. I mean, there's thousands. And as we understand more about how they operate, we understand how they misfire. And most of the illnesses that you come into contact with are a combination of genetics and environment. So for example, let's say that you're an identical twin. Let's say I'm an identical twin and I'm born into a family where there's adult onset diabetes. And when I get to be 50 years old, I gain 50 pounds and I get diabetes and my brother doesn't. Well, the genetics were there, but something had to happen to spark that manifestation. That's what your genetics are. It's a risk profile. That's all it is. Most of that stuff is never going to be a problem. But you have little, little problems in there. Now, if, something, if enough insults happen to your life, that little defect can become prominent. And so it's kind of a mixed bag to do genetic testing. Some of it's pretty clear. Like I do genetic testing for mold sensitivities and Lyme disease sensitivities. And you can get, I mean, anyone can go out and do 23andMe. You just, 23andMe.com for $199, you get your genome. And uh, you get about a million pages of things that you can't understand. But you can upload that through certain programs and learn something. Some of these genes we do know what to do with. And we, can, we have ideas of how to, um, how to intervene in a way to, to help people be healthier. Now, epigenetics is a word that people are familiar with at all. Well, epigenetics is a way that your own, your, your manipula you're not manipulating necessarily. Epigenetics is how you express your genetics. 
And so one person with, with, a, with one gene, another person has the same gene. This person, like I said, I might get diabetes because I ate too much and this person doesn't. So that's an epigenetic expression of my, geno my genetics. Well, you can do a lot with epigenetics. And what we do is mostly uh, nutritional. Um, we've figured out certain pathways where if you intervene with this substance, this problem might get better. But I'll tell you, we're at the very early stages. I mean, it's going to be years and years and years. But it's exciting. I won't open up the Pandora's box, but I'm very interested in the MTHFR gene. I think that's where you were going. Well, MTHFR, uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, is an enzyme that converts folic acid into 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, methylated folic acid. That is the active form of folic acid that we use in our body. The enzyme, MTHFR, is loaded with defects. And in some people, it actually prevents the conversion to the active form of, of folic acid. And that can cause huge problems, heart disease, well, any, any number of things. And that's a perfect example where something easy would be to just give the finished product, and you've bypassed your problem. Now, MTHFR is kind of like catching on, and it's a hot topic, and I was so jazzed by it about 12 years ago. And then I found out it's the tippiest tip of an iceberg that is gigantic. And when I had my first person do poorly with the treatment, I realized that there's a lot more here than meets the eye. And that's where we're going to go in the future. It's one of many different enzymes that we can look at right now and figure out where some problems might lie. Given um, the epidemic of ADHD and, um, and autistic spectrum disorders now, do you see any correlation with diet? And, uh, you know, I, I, I have a son who's got Asperger's, and we found a big difference when we pulled him off all the, all the you know, he had no colors, artificial dyes, artificial preservatives and things in his diet. He did much better. Can you address that in our, I, I don't know if you have any insight for you know, new parents or, or people who have kids with autism, what they might do to try to help improve? Um, well, I think that well, the question is, uh, what can we do to help kids with autism around allergies or food or other things? Well, I think that you know, my own personal and professional feeling on autism is it, it's the, the people with autism are the canaries in the coal mine. Okay? We all have the possibility to have certain illnesses. That's what our genetic makeup shows us. Some people are more vulnerable than others. And if you, if you somehow uh, trigger those vulnerabilities when you're young, well, one of the things that can happen is autism. Now, years ago, it was like 1 in 2,000, 1 in 1,000. It's now up to like 1 in 80 at a certain age of maternal uh, uh, conception. There's no way that the genetics have changed that fast. What's happened is epigenetics. The way that the genetics are being expressed is changing, and that's got to be environmental. That's what 80,000 chemicals have been introduced into our environment since World War II, and you don't have to show any safety. You have to show that it's not safe to take it out, but you can put it in. We're finding that if you do um, placenta cord blood, tons of chemicals in every baby that's born. You could be up in Alaska, up in the, the I knew it's, it's found that there are chemicals that came from across the world. You know, we've, we've polluted our, our environment, and I think we're, we're seeing are the, the effects. Autism, chemical sensitivities, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, chronic viral infections, mold toxicity. There are all these different end results of sensitivities that people have uh, had uncovered. Um, I think that foods, heavy metal toxicity, um, uh, food uh, um, vitamin deficiencies, uh, there are a lot of things that you can do to help a person with autism. That's not my specialty, but I know that there are people that do. But it's a hard road, especially for the parents. No other questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you.